Secret guardians, starry bright, fiery ones beyond our sight, saints of yore, Buddhas too, guiding lights to me and you. Chapter 7 Sweet Grass County, Montana, Hollow Tree Cabin, Absaroka Wilderness, November 2005. I awake just after seven. Late for me, but I really needed the rest. It's quiet outside. The wind has diminished. Still, from time to time, a faint low whistle can be heard as a breeze stirs and makes its way through the forest. I notice I'm out of sorts, as if a vague fear has risen in me while I slept. The words of the saint from all those years ago come to mind the tests you soon must face. I wonder if my unease is somehow connected to the new Akashic record I've been shown of my father. Am I afraid that this is just one more false lead down a dead end? Or is it me worrying about the recent attacks on East West? Especially since I left the movement in others' hands without even a day's notice. I force these thoughts aside and tend to the fire but other musings take their place. My mind just will not be still. I flash on the loneliness that consumed me after Mola's death, and on my aloneness now. I view these differently than I used to, as tests rather than burdens, and my schoolmaster is life itself, though I suspect the saints have a hand in writing the lesson plans. At last I am able to quiet my mind and start in on my morning devotions, a refuge I've grown to love more and more with Anna and her family as over time her home became my second home. A spiritual practice is a most personal thing, and mine is no exception. I do not advocate one practice over another. Really, a spiritual practice is not much more different than any other practice of a worthwhile endeavor. The more one sows, the more one reaps. That's as basic as it gets. Truth need not be hard to understand, though sometimes it is. Simple truths work best for me. By 8.30, I'm finished invoking light for the protection of friends and family especially my lost parents. For answers about them and for the protection of the defenseless innocents among us. I feel a sense of accomplishment and a measure of peace that had eluded me upon waking. I'm reminded of lines from one of Luke's songs. As the morning sun lays its light upon me, it burns the darkness from my mind. The wind is gone, Lonesome's behind me, and I'm out the door trying to make a dime. While I'm not headed out the door to a paying job, I am going to work on my task of remembering. And the darkness is burned from my mind, gone with the wind, at least for now. As I go about my chores, preparing a breakfast of rice and yams, then washing my clothes, I wonder how East West is doing without me. Before I left, or more to the point before I was extracted by Luke, we were dealing with a daunting mix of good and bad. The good was so heartening. Attendance at our conferences, which now include a diverse selection of devotional sessions, had steadily increased over the past few years. To be able to participate in an overflowing devotional in which hundreds of souls are chanting sacred Sanskrit mantras, their origins dating back and even beyond the oldest scriptures on earth, the thousands of years old Vedas, and then to step down a hall into a second auditorium where voices rise and fall, singing Silent Night, composed less than 200 years ago, one snowy Christmas in the Austrian Alps. Well, I cannot quantify how much hope this gives me for a fallen planet, but it is a lot. 
I am part of a team that organizes our conferences, which are smaller quarterly events plus one larger coming together each year. These are held in various locations to allow the widest possible access for people all over the world. The East-West Movement's mission is to provide a platform of spiritual sharing, including shared devotions and teachings, for peoples of all faiths. As there are takers who, as wolves in sheep's clothing, wrap themselves within the folds of the religions of the world, it is my additional duty, after our team has researched potential presenters for our conferences, to keep our movement as free from these counterfeits as possible. I do my best in this regard, including using my gift of seeing others' colours, which show to some degree in photos. I realise how this might sound to some, but it is what it is. We also were dealing with a rash of attacks in the press that were increasing in number and virulence as if encouraging people of different faiths to come together in a sharing spirit is somehow a cultish abomination. There was one so-called report, picked up by other self-described cult watchers, describing me as a latter-day Jim Jones figure, leading the naive down a path to perdition. Truly, when it comes to damage it can inflict, a poison pen is mightier than a sword. So, with Luke's help, I made a strategic withdrawal from Chicago, confident that Spirit of East-West was strong enough to survive without me. After all, it's an egalitarian movement of many talented and wonderful souls. Besides, I can continue to perform my other East-West duties behind the scenes. As the saints had promised, I'd been ingeniously guided by them in the resurrection of East-West, first started by my mother, now carried on by me and others. But the landscape has changed, and I've been forced to make a hasty retreat, at least for the time being. In the meantime, I've transitioned to another task, one I had no time for while in Chicago, and I love it. The chronicling of my journey to the etheric Jade Temple has renewed in me the sense of awe I felt at the time. For months I carried the memory of that experience around like a gold coin in my pocket. Now I am reminded anew of how close the saints are to us and how they have been watching over me all along. But that realisation, wondrous as it is, has given rise to questions, ones I have not had the time and space to face, until now. Was Spirit of East-West Heaven's idea all along? It sure seems so, now that I reflect back on all that has transpired. And what of my father? What part did he play with the movement? Were the combined efforts of my parents too much for certain takers to abide? Is that why they were taken? Was East-West that much of a threat? And if so, why? So many questions that need answers. But all in good time. I have to keep faith that the saints will point me in the right direction. I need to quiet my mind and listen. And that has never come easy to me. But that's all right. For now, I'm up here isolated and snowbound. I realize I don't miss the bustling of overseeing East-West. For there's another part of me I'm discovering. I really am a simple person. I find so much peace in doing daily chores and rituals. Up here... My morning devotions seem easier, as if at this higher elevation, absent the cacophony of a sprawling metropolis, there is a clearer connection to heavenly dimensions.